Alright, what's going on, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen? We are here with an, the IGN first Outlaws Fulfills the Starship Fantasy. It is muted currently because they're doing a countdown to the uh, premiere time. Um, I don't know how vocal I'm going to be. Um, I'm just here along with the ride. First reactions, first analysis. We'll see what they, uh, we'll see what they have to say. Lightsabers, blasters, and Jedi robes are all important parts of the universe's iconography. Hello there. But Star Wars just wouldn't be Star Wars without ships. X-Wings, right. TIE Fighters, the Millennium Falcon. I mean, I'd look like much, but she's got it where it counts. Just a quick look at any of these famous spaceships conjures up daydreams of freedom and adventure among the stars. And so, unsurprisingly, spaceships are kind of a big deal for Star Wars outlaws. I've been a you know Star Wars fan for for decades, and like the space side of thing is in particular quite important to me. I grew up on games like X-wing, Tie Fighter, right, okay. uh, Rogue Squadron. For today's IGM first, we spoke to staff at Massive Entertainment to find out just how they've woven the perfect starship fantasy into the first ever Star Wars open world, or perhaps more appropriate for a game where you can fly to multiple planets and moons, the first ever Star Wars open galaxy. All right. Then we'll make another one. <laughs> With five distinct, deeply detailed open worlds to explore in Outlaw's Galaxy, you'd be forgiven for thinking the inky black space between each of them would be a little empty in comparison. But Massive has applied much of the same design ethos that it uses planetside to the outer space regions. There's a lot to do. There's uh, secrets to discover, there's exploration. You can scan for opportunities, and of course, there'll be living world events or living okay. space events in okay. space. So a freighter being attacked by pirates that you can choose to help out, Empire stopping a smuggling ship that you can choose to intervene in or not. There might be some other things you can do, like a wrecked ship that's got a distress beacon. Is it, uh, is it a trap? Is it not a trap? Happy to help. Oh, I see there's still a force field intact over here, so maybe I can disable that. Everything is driven by the same kind of uh, motivation for you to you know, find the intel, follow up on it, find something interesting and tying it somewhat back to the story. Between the organic moments the living event system creates, you'll likely want to find a place to moor up, stretch your legs and scout for new opportunities. That's where space stations come in. So uh, think of them as mini cities. There'll be a cantina, there'll be a bar, people to talk to, there'll be opportunities, there'll be some back tables, there'll be secrets, there'll be exploration. There's a lot of things to do in those. Whilst they're there, they can sell things, they can buy things, they can upgrade their ship, they can pick up contracts, as well as some sort of narrative beats that will take we'll place. While outer space features some contract- We will definitely be exploring every space station and activities similar in scope to what can be accessed on the ground, Massive faced a distinct problem when it came to adventuring among the stars. Yes, Star Wars is a black space with stars mostly, and it's very hard to make something with that because there's no points of interest there, so we needed to find what makes the exotic ingredient to it. Of the, galaxy. the answer was to push the visuals of space in Star Wars further than we typically see in the movies and TV shows. Each planet had to be surrounded by regions of space that looked unique, which in turn would offer interesting gameplay challenges. We have a regulated space, that's the space that the Empire control, which is our black space with stars. And then we have our unregulated space, which is dangerous part. See the dust cloud, the debris field, if you go in there, it's gonna be more dangerous. It's not Empire controlled, you will not see like big freighters, there's like the pirates and, and, and so forth that might attack you. Mm. Akiva space is a big asteroid field, so again, that's going to present its own own challenges as well. And then we've got our other space regions that will, uh, without spoiling anything, give uh, give some fun stuff. One of the most impressive things about Star Wars Outlaws is that space is not really considered a separate entity or level from the planet surfaces. When Massive talks about Outlaws being an open world, it means on a galactic level. All five of its worlds, plus the space in between, make up the game's open world. That means there's a level of connectivity between ground and space. For example. 
example, if you become wanted by the Empire, its troops will pursue you from the surface to the stars. Yeah. So, you know, if you get into trouble on the ground and you manage to get away and to go in space, you're still going to have that wanted up on the same thing the other way around. Obviously, the Empire is not just going to let you get away. If you manage to get on their radar quite a bit, they are going to start coming after you more and more, and that's going to build up, and they're going to keep throwing things at you to the point where there'll be some, uh, some tough challenges towards the end uh, that will uh, maybe make the players regret their decisions and give them something to think about uh, before they can escape. <sighs> we made it. There's a lot of technical work that goes into creating that sense of a full open galaxy, but there's one aspect that's absolutely crucial, the seamless transition between land and space. It's one of the first things that we wanted to do is to have this connection, this player connection with the entire journey of a scoundrel. And that includes taking off from a station, a landing pad in a city or in a settlement and going into orbit and landing on a space station. All of those things are so important to this idea and to the consistency of the experience in general. Well, I think taking the player out of the experience into a loading screen kind of kills the immersion a little bit. So keeping the player like in the trailblazer, you know, as they're going through these things, experiencing it is, is quite important from that okay. kind of experience perspective. Of course, creating the seamless landing sequences requires the snowdrop engine upon which Outlaws is built to perform some pretty impressive digital wizardry. So we literally are moving you from here to over here because this is where the position is now. And then we start furiously unloading everything from behind you and start loading everything on the new map in front of you. So we move you into position and then we bring in the transition. You move into planet atmosphere and then we do a blend and we hold the ship. We reposition you. We know where you wanted to land. So we start loading that position, streaming hmm. from there and out. The rest of the systems handle everything else when you land. But once we finish loading, then we move you again back through the clouds. And that's when you fly it down to the planet's surface. Hmm. We do a camera cut and then you disembark at the location, everything being loaded. While many elements of Star Wars Outlaws is familiar, there's plenty new to see. That includes your ship, the Trailblazer. Like the Trailblazer for us is, it's a prototype. Only few ships were built, only one uh, remains. The rare nature of the Trailblazer means it is a bespoke creation for Outlaws. It's not based on any existing cargo ship in the Star Wars universe. I'll that meant Massive had almost free reign when it came to what the Trailblazer looked like, provided it had that retro 70s inspired aesthetic, of course. So I was looking at like, oh, what does the ship need? Because we need to have it very sturdy, contains valuable cargo, but also it needs to be very maneuverable because it needs to be uh, evading people who want to steal all that cargo. So my first reference was actually a turtle because, you know, out on land, they're not very, you know, agile, but in the, in the water, they can be fairly agile and they can use the jet streams in there to their advantage to be really fast. But also one of the key references for the for the front, like when you have like the big vents on the front, they all come from a Ford Mustang. I don't know if you, if you <laughs> can recognize the shapes, but they were inspired by that. The Trailblazer may be a cargo freighter, but the outer rim is a dangerous place for smugglers. That's why, much like the Millennium Falcon, it's kitted out with a few offensive options. So the Trailblazer's got a few different like weapon types that you can you can buy throughout the game and, and upgrade, as well as uh, a turret that you'll get along the way and and various missiles. Obviously, at the start, it's not going to be. It's so we know that one of the ways you get the upgraded turret is through a side quest, but it's very interesting to know that you can also purchase other upgrades. I guess outside of that, which makes me question because I don't. I believe they've said your blaster is your primary weapon. You can pick up other secondary weapons. So my th my question is, do we have to find like a master tinkerer or master works uh, blacksmith or gunsmith um, to upgrade our gun to those different abilities? But ba basically, what I'm saying is, is there a way where, for example, the the turbo blaster one of th that's one upgrade for the ship, and you have to get that through one of the uh, people to seek out so my question is like that for for like your gun can, do you find a blacksmith or weaponsmith or gunsmith whatever you want to call it and that only unlocks one thing and then you have to go and pay for other things or we don't really know what the value of the currency we don't know what it purchases i would assume it doesn't purchase ammo we just heard that you can upgrade your ship and I'm assuming that you can use it to purchase different uh, custom outfits um, 
or different maybe hairstyles and jackets and pants or looks cosmetic wise for you and Nyx. But other than that, I'm very curious to see what value the money or credits bring besides cosmetic outfits and upgrades to your ship. It's a peak power level, but then that just mirrors the kind of journey that Kay's going on as well, where, you know, she's getting used to the trailblazer. So you'll, you'll be able to change the kind of color scheme of your hull, okay. the, you know, there'll be some engine stuff that you can do. All of this is earnable in game as well. So you'll, you'll be able to make the trailblazer kind of like feel like your ship with the combination of like how you choose to put your armaments on for your gameplay style and, and the oh. visual look of it. So it'll okay. all come together for a package that like, you're happy. While there's plenty of customization options for the trailblazer, flying this ship is just one part of a much larger whole. As such, Massive hasn't turned Outlaws into a stealth flight simulator. The aim is for flying to come as naturally as walking across a planet's surface. I think making a fun, accessible experience that has like familiar controls, but still that cinematic Star Wars feel, which I think that we've we've kind of nailed with like the feeling of the, the way the ship moves and the sounds and the music, like it all comes together to, to give that player that like really good, either tense experience if they're out exploring or like action packed, like dogfighting, I think is really fun and exciting. That's not to say that your ship will control itself, though. There's some stuff that you can do there, like abilities to, like, you know, repair your, your ship and your shields and stuff, but there will be some, a little bit of light management of that, you know, with things on cooldowns. Didn't really want to lean into a, a more sim experience because, you know, Star Wars is, is for everyone, right? So we want, we want as many players to engage with the systems as possible. Attention, pilot. Abandon search. OK, are we good? We're all clear. Let's get back to the aircraft. To learn more about the wider galaxy that the Trailblazer fits into, be sure to check out our other IGN First videos about Star Wars Outlaw's open world design and the criminal gangs that populate it. And for everything else, stick with IGN. Alright. And as I said, I will... I will continue uh, to cover these videos if I find them interesting. Um, there was one that I didn't catch live, but it turned out it wasn't that much. Um, there is an article that I covered uh, yesterday, I believe, um, and I even said in that, in that video that I would, uh, what's called with this video. So, uh, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next episode. More than likely, it'll probably be, I think, I guess, next week or the week after, whenever IGN continues doing their uh, video first breakdowns, I guess. Um, and I'm assuming they're going to keep doing these until... Uh, August. Well, until the game comes out, which would be one, two, three, four, five weeks. I don't think they have another five video. I mean, maybe they do. Who knows? But uh, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Peace.